Good morning. You can do better than that. Let's do it again. Good morning. Okay. So Tom talked to you generally about sustainability in the Western United States. And it's my privilege to take that discussion and focus it on what is certainly our most precious resource in the Western United States, which is our fresh water resource. If you look at the upper left-hand picture, the girl in the bottom right-hand corner holding the uh, dog, and interestingly enough, the only person in that whole picture that's looking directly at the camera and smiling is my mother. Uh, she actually is going to turn 101 uh, this June. That particular picture was taken in the early 1920s in the Owens Valley in the eastern Sierras of California, where her father farmed a large area of land for alfalfa. The farm was on the Owens River. Uh, this particular picture is taken just above its confluence uh, with uh, the Owens Lake. That was what they farmed until Los Angeles came, bought up the water on this particular uh, farm. Uh, my grandfather, who was uh, uh, no fool, uh, sort of reversed the uh, Western misnomer that the rain follows the plow and decided that the plow should definitely follow the water. So he actually went down to the San Fernando Valley above Los Angeles, where Los Angeles was bringing that water in. And rather than plowing the land for crops, he plowed the land for subdivisions. And as a result of his efforts and thousands of people like him and the water that Los Angeles had brought down from the Owens Valley, they developed one of the largest metropolises in the Western United States. The San Fernando Valley is about 260 square miles. It's now home to about 2 million people. It's home to motion picture and TV studios and to major industries, including the aerospace industry, with major corporations such as Lockheed uh, and Rocketdyne. Uh, so this is, in some ways, uh, although some of you might disagree, the good part uh, of the uh, story. I actually grew up uh, and went to school in this particular uh, area. Uh, the problem, though, was what happened back in the Owens Valley. Before Los Angeles took the water from the Owens Valley, Owens Lake was almost the same size as the San Fernando Valley, about 175 square miles. Los Angeles's diversion of the water turned Owens Lake into a large salt flat, where today you have alkali dust storms that each year take about four million tons of dust from the lake bed, throw it into the air, causing respiratory problems for the people who are living in this particular uh, area. And as you can tell from the quotation at the bottom of this page, has decimated the wildlife that used to rely uh, upon Owens Lake. It's actually surprising, if you stop to think about it, that we've been able to build the metropolises that we have in the Western United States and to create the large industries, including the farming industries in the Western United States, given that, as all of you know, we live beyond the 100th meridian, to use Wallace Stegner's title for his biography of John Wesley Powell. This is the area that on maps in the 19th century was labeled the Great American Desert. It was an area of little rain and rain which is amazingly, startlingly unpredictable. The question is whether or not we're going to be able to continue to maintain that civilization in the future, to maintain that civilization under the same conditions, but conditions that, if anything, will actually get worse. So yesterday, you heard a fair amount about climate change. We have some significant unpredictability as to what climate change is going to do in the way of temperatures in the Western United States. We actually still know even less about what it's going to do with our water resources. What we do know, though, is that many areas of the Western United States in the face of climate change will end up in greater water stress in the future uh, than they were in the past. Uh, and that the amount of water that we have in any particular year is going to be far more unpredictable. So we'll see greater areas of, um, and greater periods of time of drought, but also greater periods and uh, greater levels uh, of uh, floods. Uh, in California, many portions of the western United States, we are vastly dependent uh, on our snowpacks. In California in particular, our snowpacks are our natural reservoir. The water gets stored there during the winter, uh, and then it melts slowly during the spring, enabling us to capture a great deal uh, of that snow melt. 
But if you look at actually what has happened over the last 50 years, so you don't have to look 50 years or 100 years into the future. You just have to look back over the past half century. What you see is, is that the amount of, uh, of, of, uh, of snowpack uh, that is available in many areas of the Western United States in order to meet our water needs has actually been going down over that period of time. And if you look at when that snowpack has been melting, what we have found that is in general that snowpack has been melting earlier and earlier each year, which is going to make it more and more difficult for us to capture that water in an effective fashion in order to be able to store it uh, in the reservoirs that we currently have available. So the question I want to talk about today is what do we need to be thinking about in order to have a sustainable water system in the Western United States in face of what we have faced in the past and what we know know we are going to be facing uh, in the future. So the first question is, what should the goals be of a sustainable water system? And here I'm going to borrow uh, from Dean Pam Matson's uh, comments yesterday morning. We first of all have to meet the water needs of the current generation. But at the same time we're doing that, we also have to ensure that we're going to be able to meet the water needs of the future generations, the water needs of those who follow us 50, 100, 200 years from now. We want to be able to do that at minimal cost. And we want to be able to do that at minimal impact on the type of environmental services uh, that we have lost in the Owens Valley. To do that, we have to totally reimagine uh, our water systems. And what I want to do today is actually lead you in what I think is an optimistic and positive uh, thought process of what should our water systems look like in the future. And I want to suggest that we need to reimagine our water systems along a variety of dimensions uh, or factors. First of all, we're going to need more resilient uh, water systems than we have today in order to deal with the greater uncertainty uh, and extremes we're going to face in the future. We're going to have to rethink our entitlement uh, to water. And I'm going to come back and talk about each of these various items. But any of you who have dealt with water know that anyone who has a water right instinctively thinks that that is their entitlement now and in the future. We have to rethink scale. We have to rethink geography. Uh, first of all, in terms of geographical scale, we're used to thinking big uh, in the Western United States. We're going to have to think uh, smaller. I was actually uh, uh, contemplating on the way over here this morning that the last time I heard anyone talk about thinking small was back when Jerry Brown was governor of California. Well, unfortunately, Jerry Brown is probably likely to be governor of California again uh, in the future. Uh, and I'm not sure the mantra is going to be think small, but it's certainly going to be think smaller. Uh, also, we're going to have to rethink our time scale because we think way too short-sightedly when we deal with water resources. We also have to think more actively about the water energy nexus because we use water not only to produce energy, but we have to take energy in order to produce water. We need to rethink our byproducts uh, of water. Uh, we have a lot of byproducts that right now we think of as waste, uh, and all we have to focus on is how do we dispose of those wastes in a favorable fashion. Uh, we not only have to reduce waste, but I actually think we can take some of those byproducts and turn them into valuable products that we can then sell. We have to think, as a lot of my comments have already suggested, about the effect of our water systems on the natural environment. But not only do we need to decrease uh, the negative impacts on our environment, but can we start thinking about how we might be able to use our water systems in order to positively restore uh, our natural environment? And then finally, we have to think and rethink and reimagine our preferred solutions uh, to the various challenges that we face in the water area. Uh, and here in particular, historically, whenever we've had a problem, we've thought about technological uh, solutions. We've thought about what we might be able to build that will solve our problems. And what we need to be doing in the future is also to think about soft solutions, how we can actually take our natural environment and use the natural environment to solve some of the problems that we face. So let me just quickly walk through uh, each of these various uh, uh, points. Uh, so resilience. One of the things that you find if you look west wide is that our water system is actually amazingly fragmented. This is a, a, a map of the northern portion of the state of uh, uh, Washington. And what I want you to see here is that although this is probably an area that should all be serviced by one water supplier, what you have is actually a total of nine 
um, uh, significant uh, water suppliers. Each of these various dots, particularly look in the Port Angeles area, rather than having one water supplier, again, you have a number uh, of separate cities uh, and water entities which are bringing water into that particular area. That frequently means these water suppliers are relatively small. They don't have the type of expertise that is going to be needed in order to deal with a number of the challenges they have now and they have in the future. Furthermore, frequently these small water suppliers are reliant upon one or, or at a maximum two different ways of supplying the water needs of their particular residents. So that means that if a threat arises to that particular uh, source of water, that that particular city or water area uh, is under uh, uh, significant threat. So in many areas of the Western United States, we do not have resilient water systems. Second of all, one of my favorite topics is entitlements. Uh, and I don't think there's anything more than this slide that basically summarizes the way in which people think about um, uh, water. Uh, probably a number of you know uh, that San Francisco takes its water from the Hetch Hetchy Valley. This was an area that uh, 100 years ago rivaled the beauty of uh, the Yosemite Valley. Uh, it is now uh, uh, flooded. It is underwater. Uh, it is the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir uh, from which San Francisco takes its water and then transports the water from the Hetch Hetchy Valley and the Sierras uh, over to uh, uh, coastal uh, San Francisco. During the Reagan administration, the Department of the Interior actually suggested maybe they should remove O'Shaughnessy Dam, which creates the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, and restore the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir to its natural condition. Now, I have a feeling that the Reagan administration did that in part because they wanted to sort of uh, uh, just tweak San Francisco uh, a little bit and see whether or not San Francisco reacted. Uh, and indeed, Mayor Dianne Feinstein did react with that the Hetch Hetchy is San Francisco's birthright. Uh, now, I'm a strong believer in uh, uh, private property uh, and the Fifth Amendment, but this notion of entitlement uh, can frequently get in the way of exactly the type of consensus discussions uh, that Tom was talking about uh, in his last slide. Imagine if rather than just jumping uh, to this relatively mindless weddedness to the concept of entitlement that Dianne Feinstein had responded to the Reagan administration's suggestion, you know, let's look at this. Let's see whether or not there's a way in which we can provide San Francisco with the water uh, that it currently needs uh, without it coming at a significant cost to San Francisco and restore this beautiful valley. If that had been Dianne Feinstein's reaction at that particular point in time, and we had had the type of discussion that Tom had emphasized in the last presentation, uh, there's actually a lot of evidence out there we might have actually begun uh, to restore uh, the Hetch Hetchy Valley today. Our notion of entitlement goes not only to the amount of water uh, that we've been receiving, but in much of the Western United States, it also goes to cheap uh, water. I don't know how many people I have talked to in the Western United States, how many water managers I have talked to uh, about changing the way in which they price their water. Because in the Western United States, on average, we only pay about a third uh, for uh, every liter of water that residents of Europe, on average, pay. As a result of that, we use twice as much uh, per capita in urban areas of the Western United States as your average European urbanist uh, uh, uses. Um, but the almost inevitable response is, this is the best way for me to be kicked out of my current position as general manager of this particular water agency. I cannot, for political reasons, talk about reforming our rate structure because no one is going to put up uh, with a higher cost uh, for water. We also have to rethink, as I mentioned earlier, uh, geographic scale. Uh, so in some ways in the Western United States, you can trace it all the way back to this particular individual. And so if I just get a little bit of audience participation here, this individual is, yeah, William Mulholland. Uh, the person who Noah Cross in Chinatown is modeled after. The gentleman who ultimately came up and took, uh, actually bought the water uh, from, my, uh, uh, from my grandfather. Uh, but he was actually very much uh, an excellent uh, civil engineer, and he had the notion uh, of going up to the Owens Valley area, 
uh, and bringing water down through a, um, uh, uh, through a gravity fed aqueduct 250 miles uh, to Los Angeles. It was a brilliant way of meeting Los Angeles's growing needs uh, at the turn of the uh, uh, century, and this idea caught on. Uh, so today you have a variety of major water projects in the western United States uh, that dam areas and then bring the water hundreds of miles to where that particular water is needed. Uh, interesting enough, by the way, uh, if you start thinking about there's central in a lot of these various terms, right? You have the Central Arizona Project, the Central Utah Project, the Central Valley Project. Uh, it says something about where our rivers tend to be and where we want the water uh, to be. But the bottom line is we are bringing water vast differences that has permitted us to grow uh, crops, to grow our civilization uh, in the western uh, United States, but it also has problems. Uh, it means that we have had to build vast uh, infrastructures. If we want to do this in the future, we're going to have to continue to build vast infrastructures that are very expensive uh, and that wear out uh, over uh, time. So in California today, we are very worried about the investment that we're having to make in a period of little money. Uh, in very uh, sizable, lengthy uh, water infrastructure. In many areas of the western United States, this infrastructure also consumes significant uh, amounts of energy. Uh, these are the pumps that take water from northern California and pump that over the Tehachapi Mountains in, uh, to the Los Angeles uh, Basin. Uh, and in addition to that, as we've talked about already, these large water projects frequently have environmental consequences, uh, including for the, uh, 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 the delta of the Colorado River, which was once one of the areas of greatest uh, biodiversity in the western United States, but is now deprived of much of the water that historically uh, supported uh, that particular uh, biodiversity. But we have to uh, uh, rethink not only the geographical scale uh, at which we meet our water needs, but also the time scale. And as I suggested earlier, uh, we are frequently very short-sighted. And the best example of that uh, is our pumping uh, of groundwater. Groundwater is uh, an amazingly uh, 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 valuable uh, resource, uh, and we can use it on a uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, basis. But the problem comes when we overdraft uh, our groundwater uh, aquifers, when we take more more water out of our groundwater aquifers uh, than are naturally uh, uh, replenished uh, in those uh, uh, aquifers. Uh, and we are doing that, as I'll show in a moment, throughout the uh, uh, western United States. And when we mine those groundwater aquifers, we are taking water that would otherwise be available for uh, future uh, generations. Uh, we are also, at the uh, uh, same time, uh, reducing uh, the level of the uh, uh, water table. So here's the map that I promised you, uh, which actually shows water level declines to the degree that we know them, because there are actually significant areas of the West where we're not uh, effectively monitoring uh, our groundwater tables, but showing the drop uh, in the groundwater levels uh, in the aquifers, again, where we have uh, the information. Now, of course, as the groundwater levels drop, that means that we require, again, more energy uh, in order to pump that water out uh, for the use of the, uh, uh, the residents. There are also a variety of other uh, implications uh, over the long term. So if you have a coastal aquifer, like we have many uh, in the state of uh, California, you have the freshwater aquifer, which is perched up against the salt water. And to the degree that you mine that aquifer uh, in uh, a relatively uh, uh, unconstrained fashion, what happens is, is that you actually bring that salt water in, uh, contaminating the uh, freshwater and making it uh, uh, unusable uh, for the purposes for which you have historically relied upon it. You also have, uh, through many areas of the western United States and the world as a result of groundwater uh, mining, uh, you have surface subsidence. So this is actually, I think, one of the most dramatic pictures I've ever uh, seen. This is in the Central Valley of California, a major agricultural region that has been mining its groundwater for uh, close to a century. Uh, this is a picture taken in 1977. You see this gentleman standing here uh, with the 1977 uh, uh, sign. Uh, this is where the surface of this area of the uh, San Joaquin Valley was in 1925. So you see the dramatic subsidence of the San Joaquin uh, Valley, uh, which increases the flood risk uh, for significant portions of the San Joaquin uh, Valley. 
Uh, but you can also see other risks from subsidence. This is actually in Mexico City, where you've had subsidence as a result of the groundwater uh, mining take place at different um, uh, rates at different points, uh, and so that can also lead to uh, structural failure uh, in the building which overlies uh, the uh, uh, aquifer. Another problem which we have not paid enough focus on in the western United States is that groundwater mining and groundwater pumping generally can also impact our uh, surface uh, streams. So to the degree, as in this particular slide here, you have groundwater, which is actually feeding a river to the degree that you put your pump in there, then what you're going to be doing is drawing the surface water uh, back towards the uh, groundwater. The Cosumnes River, which is one of uh, uh, the most beautiful uh, undeveloped uh, river regions in California, uh, has very low flows in large part because of the groundwater pumping that is occurring nearby, rather than the actual diversions from that particular River. So these are all of the various costs of groundwater mining. But again, getting back to the question of temporal scale, of time scale, we tend to focus on our immediate needs for the water and therefore mine our groundwater aquifers rather than thinking about the long-term implications of that groundwater mining. We also need to pay, as I mentioned earlier, greater attention to this water energy nexus. Now, I historically have always thought about water as generating uh, electricity uh, and energy. But in fact, in many areas of the Western United States, water is a major consumer uh, of uh, energy. Uh, I have the best uh, statistics uh, from the state of California. If you just look at the electricity aspect of our energy budget, what you see is, is that almost 20% of the electricity in the state of California is utilized uh, for, uh, for water purposes. Uh, for transporting that water, pumping the water out of the um, uh, ground, uh, purifying uh, that um, uh, water. And in the future, because of the fact that one I think can safely expect that energy will probably go up uh, in cost over time, this becomes more and more of a uh, uh, consideration. Which means that when we think about how we want to bring water in uh, to growing areas, uh, we need to think about not only what are the immediate costs of various alternatives, but how much energy is needed by various alternatives. So this actually looks at uh, the cost of various additional ways of bringing water into Southern California. Uh, and what you'll see is there's a lot of discussion these days of uh, desalination. But of course, if you think that energy in the future is going to be more expensive, uh, and that our energy consumption is very important from the standpoint of climate change, uh, then desal is not uh, the way in which we want to be thinking about the water scarcities that that global climate change is likely to, uh, uh, to lead to, because then you're simply uh, in a positive feedback loop where your response to the problem makes the problem all the worse. Instead, what we should be thinking about is groundwater and something I'm going to come back to later, uh, which is recycling uh, of our water. We also, as I mentioned earlier, have to be thinking about byproducts in a new way. So historically, again, our byproducts were, were waste. We tried to clean it to the best we possibly could. We then discharge it into our waterways and hope that we don't get this type of beautification uh, 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 of our water systems. In the future, what we need to be thinking about is can we take that waste and can we convert some of it uh, into a valuable uh, product? This point's probably overly obvious, but again, we have to think even more carefully than we have in the past about how our water systems affect the natural environment. In California, we take a lot of water from uh, Northern California. We bring it through what's known as the Delta area uh, and then down into our Southern farming regions and our Southern uh, uh, cities. And you can see, if you look at the exports of water from our delta, you can see that over time, over the last 40 years, we have been gradually increasing uh, our exports from the delta. Um, from the standpoint of the development of Southern California, that's a good thing. From the standpoint of fish species in the delta, it's another uh, issue. So we have uh, several endangered or threatened fish species in the delta. One is the delta smelt, 
uh, which is this uh, uh, dark line. As you can see, it was sort of uh, doing fairly well uh, until you get to about 1983. Then you see a collapse uh, as basically sort of uh, uh, deadlined uh, since 2005. Uh, another uh, endangered species uh, is the winter run schnook uh, salmon. That's the dotted line. Started out even better than the uh, uh, smell. Uh, again, uh, it has uh, uh, cratered uh, since the late 1970s, although there has been some recent evidence uh, that it's at least uh, still there. We also, again, need to be rethinking our preferred solutions. Our historical solutions to problems, such as you have here uh, a, um, uh, a watershed uh, that's bringing water into a uh, city downstream. And what you're beginning to see here is some development uh, that's occurring in this particular watershed that will affect the water quality of that particular stream. Rather than thinking about natural solutions, which would be protecting the watershed, instead what we have historically done is to look at engineered solutions, such as building a water purification. Uh, plan. I did a survey about five years ago uh, with Sandra Postel of water suppliers in the state of California. I surveyed all water suppliers with over 50,000 customers and I basically looked to see what they were doing in order to protect uh, their watersheds uh, from encroaching uh, development. Uh, and what I found was that very few of them had taken any steps in recent decades uh, to protect their watersheds uh, from uh, the encroaching uh, development. To the degree they had taken any steps, they had only acquired very small uh, parcels uh, of land. Uh, and instead of protecting their watersheds, what they continually did was upgrade uh, their water purification facilities. And because they had water purification uh, facilities, interestingly enough, many of them, to the degree they actually held significant amounts of their watershed land, were managing that land in ways such as logging, which were actually inconsistent with the way in which you would manage it uh, if you were worried about water pur purification. But having set up this artificial solution to water purification, it meant that they no longer had to worry quite as much uh, about the natural uh, uh, watershed. And we've not only adopted technological solutions rather than softer natural solutions to issues of water quality, but to the degree that we've needed to store water. Rather than thinking about storing water in available storage capacity, which might be in our underground aquifers, we've always historically thought about building a dam uh, and storing the water above ground. To the degree that we have worried about flood control, rather than thinking about protecting the natural flood plains to, for example, acquiring from farmers flood easements, instead what we have done uh, is to build large flood control uh, projects. So what I want to spend the remaining amount of my time talking about, and I'll just be able to touch on some of the various things that we should be thinking about here, is how can we take these various factors and dimensions and actually begin to think about transforming uh, our water uh, systems? So again, let me just walk through uh, a few ideas. First of all, there are the obvious reforms uh, that I think the slides that I've shown so far and everything that you probably already know about water would point us to. We need to actually manage uh, our groundwater. Um, we have literally millions of acre feet of water which we are overdrafting from our groundwater aquifers in the western United States every year. Uh, that should no longer be occurring. We need to integrate our groundwater and surface water so that we actually actively treat the two resources together and that we make sure that, for example, groundwater pumping is not negatively impacting surface water users, including the fish. Uh, we need to reduce the fragmentation of our water suppliers. Uh, so that we don't have the radically defragmented system that we find in some areas of the West. And we need to more actively and carefully consider the environmental impacts. So these are the obvious uh, reforms. Uh, perhaps another obvious reform is that we have to actually recognize uh, the true cost of our water. Uh, here in 
Utah, uh, as far as I can tell, you are all charged volumetrically for your water. So if you use more water, you have to pay more. Uh, one thing that always startles me is that there are millions of people in the Western United States uh, that still actually do not get charged by the quantity of water uh, that they use. Their water is not metered, uh, which means that from their perspective, once they pay their property taxes or their uh, uh, monthly bill, which is a flat uh, bill, uh, water is costless. Um, and we all know that, if anything, it's exactly the, uh, uh, the opposite. Uh, and the best way of actually reducing water use that we know of is to begin to meter uh, water. This is from a uh, Canadian study, uh, but the particular results of this Canadian study are replicated in every other study I've seen uh, in any developed uh, country, which is if you go from a flat rate unmetered water uh, to a metered system, you find that people reduce their water use just as a result of the metering the water uh, by about uh, a third. But we need in the Western United States to go beyond metering and actually charge people uh, the real cost of the water. The marginal cost of bringing that last gallon of water into the area. Uh, and the best way of doing that uh, is a tiered uh, rate system. And I understand that here in Utah there are uh, sort of a growing number of tiered systems. But again, that's an exception. Uh, here you have the Coachella Valley Water District uh, in Southern California. This is their tiered system. Their bottom tier is priced so that everyone is insured their water. As a basic human right, you should have a minimum amount of water. You shouldn't have to pay very much for that. So that's the basic tier. They then have a second sort of average tier, uh, which is set out at sort of the normal amount of water that somebody uses. And then if you go beyond that, you pay for that last gallon of water uh, a higher and higher price. We need to go throughout the Western United States to this type of a tiered water system. And equally importantly, we need to make sure that the tiers matter. One of the things that I've seen in a variety of water districts that are adopting these tiered systems is that they adopt a tiered system, but virtually no one ever ends up in this third or fourth category. So no one really, except for maybe 5 or 10% of the population, is facing the real marginal cost of bringing uh, uh, the last quantity of water. Uh, into the uh, uh, valley uh, or region. So again, sort of an obvious solution. We need to actually make sure that people are paying and therefore recognizing uh, the true cost of uh, uh, water. Now getting back to resilience, one of the things that we should be doing is diversifying our water supply system. Uh, we should be making sure in every area that we have multiple sources of, uh, uh, of meeting the water needs of a particular uh, area, so that if one is threatened, there are other sources available. And in thinking about that diversification, we also need to be thinking about the other issues that we talked about earlier. We need to be thinking smaller rather than larger. We need to be thinking in terms of sources that have lower energy use rather than larger energy use. So for diversification, we need to be thinking about demand management, meeting the needs of the population by reducing demand through well, uh, conservation. We need to be thinking about water storage. And as I'll come back to in a moment, we need to be thinking about how we don't have to build a new dam and reservoir to store that water, but we can store that water in underground aquifers. We need to be thinking about new local supplies. Frequently, as I suggested earlier, in places like California, we're thinking about desal, but desal, in my view, is not the answer because of the high energy uh, consumption of desal, but instead we should be thinking about recycling. I'll come back and talk about that in a moment. And then we also need to be thinking about having more active and flexible water markets. I won't talk about that, but I'll be glad to answer questions about it later. So again, when we're thinking about storage as one of the ways of our diversifying our uh, water supply systems, rather than building new surface uh, water storage, we need to be thinking about to what degree can we store the water in underground uh, aquifers. These underground aquifers where you actually store the water down in here have a variety of um, uh, advantages. Um, you have reduced uh, evaporation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the water. Uh, it's something that is there. You don't have to uh, uh, build it. Uh, in those areas which are prone to earthquakes, uh, you have less concern about the uh, uh, structural uh, safety. 
And to the degree that you store water in these underground aquifers, you also might be able to get some co-benefits. Uh, so this is a groundwater storage project uh, in California. And what you'll see is this uh, area here, which is uh, uh, the area where they pond the water so that it can then filter down into the underground aquifer. This type of a, uh, uh, of a system uh, can also, if managed correctly, and this can be a tricky issue, but if managed correctly, it can also serve uh, as a restored wetland. Uh, throughout much of the western United States, we have destroyed our natural wetland. So this might be a way that we can not only store our water, uh, stretch the available water supply, uh, but at the same time help to uh, uh, restore uh, the natural uh, environment. And then the thing that I want to spend probably the most of my remaining time on uh, is the idea of making greater use of uh, uh, reclaimed uh, water. So again, what do we do today? Uh, right now we have the city that needs some more water and we have uh, uh, this river that maybe has some unappropriated uh, water in it, if we're, if we're lucky. Uh, so what we do right now is we take the water out of the river and we transport it hundreds of miles uh, away to this particular city, uh, which consumes a great deal of, um, of energy. Uh, then after the city uses it, uh, we take all of the uh, sewage, uh, we treat that sewage water, uh, and then we dump it back into well, uh, a river or an ocean, and the whole cycle just uh, begins again. Um, this, for all the various reasons I talked about earlier, might not make as much sense uh, as basically just short-circuiting the cycle and having that, uh, where, yes, we'll continue to bring water into this particular city, but why can't we just reclaim that water uh, and move it right back into the uh, uh, city uh, again? Uh, the technology is there uh, to do this, and the technology is relatively inexpensive in comparison to the price that we are increasingly paying uh, to import water into areas of the western uh, United States. The major issue here uh, is how do we increase uh, the market uh, for this type of uh, uh, reclaimed uh, water. Uh, and so this is an area, again, for uh, our uh, uh, combined uh, ingenuity. Uh, throughout much of the western United States, we have areas that are using reclaimed water uh, to irrigate uh, their landscapes, their soccer fields. In some areas, such as uh, uh, Palo Alto, we're actually using our reclaimed water to restore uh, our natural uh, habitats. We're also in some areas of the uh, uh, West beginning to think about using our reclaimed water for agricultural uh, purposes. This is a picture of uh, uh, the Monterey Bay area. And what we are doing right now is taking the sewage water from Monterey. Uh, we are uh, uh, cleansing that. And then what we are doing is using it on agricultural areas out in this region. And we're also using some of it to uh, pump water back down into our groundwater aquifers to avoid that problem of seawater intrusion that I talked about earlier. This particular project is the largest urban to ag uh, recycling project in the world uh, at the moment. Uh, and then in some areas, we're also using that water for uh, industrial uh, purposes, in this particular case, uh, for uh, power plants. Uh, the next step, the more difficult step, uh, is trying to get that water to be used by the ultimate uh, consumer, uh, all of us in this particular uh, room. Uh, now, uh, reclaimed water is, in many areas, uh, pretty fit to drink. Um, uh, some of you probably know Singapore now produces something called new water, uh, which is reclaimed water for consumptive purposes. But my guess is uh, this eau naturelle water, uh, I have absolutely no idea where it actually comes from. Uh, but if I told you this was reclaimed water, uh, actually, let me just ask, how many of you in this room, if I told you this was reclaimed water from uh, the Salt Lake City uh, sewage system, how many of you would drink it? Okay, pretty good. I actually asked this of a Stanford class the other day, and I was amazed. Like about a third of the students actually volunteered to, well, uh, to drink the stuff, because in most areas of the world, people don't want to uh, drink that uh, water. Uh, but Orange County uh, has actually come up with, uh, uh, with a relatively simple way around the problem that a lot of people don't want to directly drink uh, the sewage water. What they do is that they take their reclaimed water, uh, they spread it over their underground aquifer, which uh, used to have an overdrafting uh, problem. Uh, the water filters down into the groundwater, uh, and then they pump the groundwater up, and they supply it to their customers. Um, 
And amazingly, a lot of people don't seem to think, well, this is the reclaimed water that I probably would not have drunk directly if you hadn't put it down in the underground uh, aquifer uh, to begin with. Uh, and this is, in the United States, the largest uh, urban recycling uh, operation uh, that currently uh, uh, exists. But I want to take this idea of recycling one more step which is right now, when we think about water reclamation, what we're thinking about is that water, which does make up about 99.9% uh, of uh, uh, the wastewater. But you know, all of that stuff uh, is, a, uh, uh, is a useful uh, uh, product. So could we begin to actually pull out more than just the water? Uh, actually, Europe uh, pulls out a lot of energy uh, from its wastewater. Uh, we're nowhere close uh, to these particular numbers, but Europe is quite proud of the fact that it generates a significant amount of energy from its wastewater uh, operations. So here's the last sort of big idea. Right now, imagine all these dots are uh, houses or communities in a big uh, city. Right now what we do is we have a massive water supply system that takes water and supplies it to all these folks. And then we have a sewage system. That sewage system are all these various lines that take the sewage, bring it all the way down to this uh, treatment plant. Now if we want to recycle the water and distribute it back out again, one of the problems is at least today we're going to need a new piping system in addition to the old piping system because in most areas you're not permitted to take the same piping system that you use for the fresh water and also use it for uh, reclaimed uh, water. So it turns out to be a fairly expensive system. Furthermore, if you look at this system of the centralized uh, recycling, okay, you take all this water and this is where you reclaim things. What you find is, is that if you actually look at the valuable contents of the water, about the only one that's actually profitable to mine that sewage for uh, is the water. But what if we take our city again, and rather than doing a central treatment, what I want to do is I want to start scalping water. I want to have a whole variety of smaller reclamation plants, and this is again technologically feasible, it's cost effective, take these little scalping facilities and pull the water out of the sewage system at that point, reclaim the water, distribute the water to this local community. And this way, by the way, those of you who are willing to drink the reclaimed water, maybe you can move into one of these areas that has a little scalping facility and then you can start drinking that reclaimed water. Um, and uh, uh, so we actually avoid having to reproduce that huge piping uh, system again. Uh, furthermore, if you then just leave into the system you know, the stuff that's not the water, because you take the sewage out, you reclaim it, you use the water, you take all the rest of the stuff, you put it back down in the sewage system, then by the time all of that remaining sewage gets to your central facility, look what's happened. It now becomes profitable to actually take out some of the other valuable products from that particular rough system, which then means you not only have the scalping system, but furthermore, this treatment plant down here can now begin to harvest a whole variety of other things, including water. It can now harvest uh, the energy uh, and the uh, nutrients uh, that are in that particular uh, water uh, supply. Next, and I know I'm out of time, so two more slides, okay? One is soft solutions, okay? New York is the best demonstration of a soft solution. They had a lot of development encroaching in the Delaware and Catskills uh, watershed. You know, historically, what would they do? They would actually purify that water. They examined two options, though. One was building a filtration facility, huge capital costs, very large operating costs. The other alternative was to actually preserve the watershed. And notice that the preservation of the watershed is a much lower cost than building that filtration facility. So New York City, rather than building a new filtration facility for their Delaware and Catskills watershed system, now instead um, uh, are actively trying to protect uh, that uh, uh, watershed. And the final just thought here, another soft solution is, okay, we have this uh, uh, sewage facility again. Rather than trying to purify uh, that water uh, through technological means, what about also using uh, a natural idea, which is recreating wetlands and then passing that sewage water through the wetlands in order to get uh, a lot of the contaminants uh, out of that water. This is an experimental system taking place right now in uh, Southern California. The test results show f so far uh, are extremely good on this. So here's, again, a soft solution. 
that rather than potentially negatively impacting the environment, actually improves the environment. So again, what I hope all of you will go away today with the major message is simply, let's all rethink our water systems. And if we do that, we will be able to get to a sustainable water future. So thank you very much.